uh, the COVID-19 uh, in general. If you're on campus, you need to wear a mask regardless of your vaccination status. So if you do come and meet with me uh, for face-to-face -face actual office hours, because I have both face-to-face uh, -face and virtual, uh, please make sure that you are masked up and I'll be masked up as well. Um, so there is a whole section on that. And there's also a section on health and well-being. So again, syllabus, you can find it over here in the syllabus and orientation section of Blackboard. All right, so the next thing that you're going to want to access is the section called, of course it doesn't wanna go for me, uh, course content. And yeah, now it's taking forever. Uh, course content is where um, there's going to be a folder each week that um, has um, each week's videos and this is where you're gonna find this I'm gonna direct you to this but I'm gonna also you know I'm gonna direct you um, but each week you're gonna have that there uh, so make sure oh gosh you click on it I know this seems like kind of redundant but I'm probably gonna do a short shorty video of this on how to get here um, and then so you so actually I'll go back so you go back I'm gonna go back to course content so this is gonna fill up but with folders um, but week one click on it and you're gonna see a variety of content and videos and uh, for this week, we do have a lot of videos in here, so make sure you scroll all the way down. And there's a lot of fun things for you to view on your own as, um, as I talk. And so this is also going to be a time for you to pause on the video from time to time. And this is also a time for me to grab <laughs> some information as I uh, get into a little bit of my discussion uh, briefly about the class and briefly about um, these clips that I have all listed in here. So uh, the soundtrack, when we think about the soundtrack in film and the soundtrack in media, uh, you wanna you know, think about uh, how it functions with the visuals and how it functions with the narrative or how it doesn't function with the narrative. Now, um, though a lot of things I'm going to mention right now is how it pertains to how um, music is used in film. Uh, many of these instances will also be included uh, in how dialogue and sound effects are used. Now, when we th think of the th three basic elements of sound, we have the voice, we have sound effects, and if you're a really adept listener, uh, you could probably hear the room tone and you might hear a fan in the background and you might have just heard my earrings just jingle jangle. Uh, so this would give it authenticity to this video, but the idea is that sound effects are both, can be both the natural elements uh, to give a, a sense of authenticity or the, the sound effects can be used to uh, create a uh, fictionalized world, a world that may be not, not realistic at all. I mean, Chewbacca. Chewbacca is not real. It's a man in a suit. Uh, but through the use of sound effects, uh, we've created a voice for Chewbacca, and it's all—it's a variety of different animals that uh, that are the voice of Chewbacca. Uh, so sound effects, and we have the use of music. So three things: voice, sound effects, music. But there is actually also a fourth element, and that is silence. And this is something that can be used very dramatically in screen media. 
uh, in order to punctuate certain things. So that's a very, very brief overview of the basic elements of the soundtrack. Um, and sound in general, when you're thinking about it with screen media, uh, it can work uh, what is known as diegetically and non-diegetically. Diegetically means it's within the story space. The characters within the story space, within the film, within the television show, within the video game, can hear the sounds uh, that are going on. And so that's what we refer to as diegetic. Non-diegetic is sounds that are outside of the story space. Only the audience can hear these sounds. Typically, this is what you hear uh, in a musical score. A musical score is a way for us to be heightened by emotion or to be um, uh, learn some information about a character uh, or to hide the mistakes <laughs> that are made by the visuals. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so typically the score is considered non-diegetic. It's outside of the story space. Uh, sometimes songs uh, are featured that way as well. Uh, so when we think of, in particular, the use of these three basic elements of voice, music, and, and sound effects, probably a great example of using all these three elements and in particular uh, the voiceover would be Apocalypse Now in the opening sequence. It also uses pop music uh, in this opening sequence, uh, The Doors, The End. Now I'm going to warn you and I should do this warning is that uh, this class we are, we are going to be watching clips that can have uh, adult language, adult content, and violence and horror. If there are anything that uh, that in particular you um, cannot handle, please make sure that you uh, let me know right away. Uh, though it seems like most of my clips today are dealing with something as horrific as war, shark attacks, uh, a you know a psycho killer. Uh, and um, and also crime. Uh, we do have aliens in there as well, and so that one's probably our most innocent. Uh, oh yeah, and I forgot Travis Bickle. And I'm making a romance comedy horrific. And then I've got something. We end it very humorously. So uh, the beginning of Apocalypse Now is is a fantastic example of the use of sound effects. It's a great use of uh, a song in particular and a great use of voiceover. And uh, this is from uh, the Francis Ford Coppola. Uh, Martin Sheen is the main character in this sequence. Uh, the sound design and sound editor for this film is Walter Murch and uh, basically they opened up a new category in sound uh, based on the, many of the things that Walter Murch was doing and I believe he did win a special Oscar for this film um, but listen to this clip uh, the opening sequence of Apocalypse Now right now and uh, listen to the different elements as it pertains to sound effects the use of voiceover and the use of music All right, so you've watched the clip, and as you could hear, it does give you a lot of information about the character of Willard and the state of mind. Uh, you also have the great use of not only the sounds of the helicopter that turns into the sound of the fan and the sounds of Saigon, but you also have um, the music that kind of punctuates the state of mind of Willard. And this is the character that we're going to be following in the film. He is going to be actually the person that is the least insane 
of our characters. So this is the hero that we'll be follow, you know, following into the heart of darkness. And this opening sequence is just a fantastic way uh, for us to not only give you the state of mind of our hero um, or our protagonist, uh, but also uh, the insanity of war, which is part of uh, the setup of, of this sequence. Now, the next two clips I have uh, pertains to the film Jaws. And this is uh, a nice, also a nice way to talk about the relationship between Steven Spielberg and John Williams, which then also gets extended out to George Lucas, and and John Williams has directed or not directed has composed many original scores uh, for many filmmakers uh, through the seventies, eighties, um, and is uh, he's still producing original scores today? Um, but uh, a couple things that are unique in these clips that I have. For, uh, for Jaws and then for uh, Close Encounters is how uh, one of the things that you can do with sound um, and especially music is that uh, you can start to create uh, you know, a variety of different uh, unique uh, uh, sequences. You can start to create les motifs which are common elements that become a theme or phrase that gets repeated and it can be associated to a character. Uh, and this is something that we start to identify with. Um, also melodies can also be associated with certain characters. Um, and these are a lot of times very um, easily singable, hummable tunes. So when we think of Jaws, a lot of times we think of the Jaws theme, and a lot of it is the dun 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 Well, it's the dun 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 where we know Jaws is coming, but we also use this music to give you point of view shots of the shark. And so the music not only um, is a way to anticipate the shark, the killer, great white, um, but also is used to give the shark's point of view at times. So we have this great opening, or it's not opening sequence, it's, it's, it's well into the film and the beaches should be closed, but they're not. And so Chief Brody is, is here and he's trying to both be on the job, kind of relax. He's reassured that, you know, the shark isn't going to attack. <laughs> and so, uh, so how we have this, this scene where people are talking to Chief Brody, uh, you know, inquiring, you know, on this very busy beach day, um, you know, where's this shark? that, you know, he's worried about. And then we hear the music. And then we have this great uh, trombone shot um, where we also experience the terror and the horror that Chief Brody is experiencing at this time with the shark attack. So with that, and also the theme, if you're not familiar with the Jaws theme, Watch these two clips uh, to show not only do we have a characterization of the shark, and so we start to have music that are associated with a character, and this is some of the functions of, um, of music. This can also be a function of sound effects as well, um, but, and it also becomes a signifier of emotion. Uh, so fear, horror, terror, um, these are all things that Chief Brody is experiencing in this scene uh, through the shot. So, um, so watch the get out of the water scene and then listen to the theme from Jaws. Or you can listen to the theme to Jaws and then watch the scene either way, especially if you're not familiar with it. So I, uh, I suggest you do that now. 
All right, so you've watched the scene and you've listened to this music if you've never listened to it before. And again, it's a great way, uh, again, to give this uh, scene a way of giving you haha, the point of view of the shark and the horror of Chief Brody. Now, again, John Williams is able to create this music that though for Jaws is for the audience and only for the most part we hear it non-diegetically. It's outside of the story space even though it gives us clues and when the shark's going to be here it gives us clues to the state of mind of Chief Brody. But he does something very clever in Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind and he creates uh, music he creates the five tones as a way for the aliens to communicate with the humans and for the humans, in this case, many of the scientists and government figures in order to communicate with the aliens. And so this form of the five tones, the do 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 becomes a reoccurring melody and a reoccurring little motif throughout the entire film. Uh, it is something though that the characters within the film hear. You have um, uh, spiritual men, uh, you know, making these sounds. Uh, you have these sounds being picked up, uh, you know, all over the world. And then we have this final scene uh, where we actually make contact with the aliens and so uh, so this is a great way for John Williams to take a melody that we've already heard several times throughout the film but use it in a way diegetically the way music can use to communicate between two two characters two be beings that don't have the same language in order to communicate. So they are using the five tones as a way to communicate. So watch this fantastic scene from Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I think it's time for you to play the five tones. Okay, you're back. And so there you can see how Steven Spielberg was able to utilize John Williams to give you a form of communication between the aliens and the humans. And, uh, and John Williams was also in Jaws able to give you uh, a sense of a killer and a killer that you don't necessarily see. Uh, so speaking of killers, uh, we are now moving on to Psycho. Woo! I know you're super excited about this. Albert Hitchcock's Psycho. Uh, the score is composed by Bernard Herrmann. Bernard Herrmann, who, uh, who actually was composing and doing sound and music uh, for radio plays. Uh, and he even did the music for Orson Welles' um, War of the Worlds. He provided, uh, you know, uh, uh, scores and soundtracks to television shows, uh, to Orson Welles' uh, um, Citizen Kane. Um, but he did something very unique and different uh, with Psycho and uh, and he gives us um, the soundtrack to murder and we kind of get this anticipation of this murder even with the opening credits uh, so what we have is this fantastic opening sequence that gives you um, a clue of many of the themes that you're going to be hearing throughout the film, but also that this is going to be terrifying, especially through the use of, of strings. And that's another thing. Um, specific instruments are meant to give you a certain, uh, uh, certain feelings, certain emotions. Um, they convey, uh, you know, a sense of fear and trembling. Um, a lot of times you 
associate the theremin um, as an instrument that's a lot of times associated with uh, with science fiction because it does sound out of this world. Um, Bernard Herrmann definitely provided uh, the use of violins and strings to give this sense of uh, foreboding. So if you've never heard the opening credits to Psycho, uh, I have a clip there for that. It gives you the sense of mood and style. And then we have the iconic bathroom murder sequence or the shower sequence where poor Marion Crane um, becomes the subject of murder. Uh, and how, for the most part, it's the sound that basically tells us she is being killed. So watch these two sequences. Uh, for uh, what Bernard Herrmann is able to contribute to Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. So the sounds of the strings, and there is the sounds of stabbing, uh, um, probably into a melon, but, uh, but the, the sounds that Bernard Herrmann created uh, as Marion Crane is being murdered uh, gives us the illusion that she's being murdered. Um, if you do dissect the scene, and this is something that I have, when I've taught a section on editing um, or uh, talking about uh, Soviet montage, um, it's one of those things where when you break down the shower sequence, murder sequence, uh, you never see the knife really penetrate the skin. There's one scene where it's a dimple underneath the uh, uh, underneath the uh, the belly button, but the idea is that through the editing and definitely through the sound design, uh, we become viewers of the murder of Marion Crane. Um, now, Bernard Herrmann, no stranger to Psychos, uh, his final film. Uh, was Martin Scorsese's film for tax or score for Scorsese's film Taxi Driver, and Robert De Niro's Travis Bickle is definitely one of those characters that has a fractured state of mind, uh, and he also has a not your typical sense of what is good and evil, and his uh, his ethical compass is is a little off. Uh, he is a man who uh, was, you know, in the military. Uh, he is someone, though, it, it's very early on, um, though we're not really discussing it, but he does have some sort of PTSD. Um, but he does see himself as the hero in the story. And I don't think it's really that much of a spoiler if you hadn't seen it. Um, his idea of uh, a good movie is a porno. And so he goes and sees pornos all the time. He even takes a date to go see a porno. Though at the same time, he sees himself as a man that's going to clean up the streets and clean up uh, the things that are wrong with America today, starting with the filthy streets of New York City. And so the opening title sequence of Taxi Driver definitely gives you insight in the state of mind of Tra Ta the, <laughs> the state of mind of Travis Bickle, and how he sees himself, and how we see him, and also how he sees the streets. So we have this score that matches a lot of how we see the city that it is, it's brutal, it's tough, it's dirty, it's grimy, it's full of crime. Also, we have a lot of rain sequences. We also have a lot of the use of red. But notice when you look at the eyes of Travis Bickle, how we switch to a more romantic, jazzy scene, where it almost, he sees himself as the hero in his story. He sees himself as the one that can be able to clean things up. 
um, he sees himself as a character of maybe a film noir where he's going to save the femme fatale. Uh, so, so definitely, um, you know, listen to the different moods of this opening sequence and how it definitely gets you into the state of mind of Travis Bickle. All right, this next one is definitely a more contemporary scene. And this is definitely one of those that gives you uh, a great sense of how you can use a piece of song, a mu uh, you know, um, a specific piece of music and use it in a way that um, is quite striking. Um, I'm talking about uh, Edgar Wright's opening sequence to Baby Driver. And so we have this robbery sequence that is completely choreographed and set to, and the getaway is completely choreographed and set to the John Spencer blues explosion song, Bell Bottoms. And we, as an audience, hears this song, but also our main character, Baby, who is the getaway driver, he knows the song, hears the song, we even, we even see him kind of do his own little dance moves choreographed to this song. And if you've watched the film, Baby Driver, uh, or Baby, he listens to his iPod all the time and he uses specific songs as a way to calculate um, and time. Uh, his getaways from uh, from these bank robberies. So he has a specific soundtrack for him to listen to, uh, for him to concentrate on how he is able to uh, get away from the cops and how he's able to get away from the scene. Um, Bell Bottoms uh, by John Spencer. The song uh, was a song that's been in Edgar Wright's uh, head for a long time and the sequence is something that he has been wanting to do for quite some time. And so he's finally able to do his his uh, car movie that is also a heist movie. One last score, one last score. Um, and he's able to set it to, to this sequence. So this is all diegetically playing. So not only the characters within the film hear this or in certain cases, just baby, um, but we hear it as well. So that's why it's diegetic. And um, also, if you've seen the movie, John Spencer himself from the John Spencer Blues Explosion does have a small part in the film towards the end of the film. Uh, he is a prison guard. So um, he's got the mustache and the glasses. So enjoy um, and pay attention to how this whole scene is choreographed. And yes, you can choreograph a scene, even for a car chase scene, how this all choreographed to the song Bell Bottoms. Bell Bottoms, huh! Bell Bottoms, huh! All right, watch the scene. Now our final two clips are kind of fun in the fact that, uh, what you could do with sound, especially if you already have a preconceived notion of what you're watching and how you can change things. And this is something that's very uh, common now, uh, especially in the age of um, with YouTubes and memes and, and, uh, and all that sort of thing. I mean, um, is pace people doing various mashups or changing things around? Uh, to make them a little different. And one of the easiest ways that you can change something is by changing the soundtrack. And so if you are familiar with the movie Love Actually, Love Actually is about people and different stages of love. Uh, and there's a scene where, um, where Keira Knightley is, is already married but um, Andrew Lincoln, uh, he's in love with Keira Knightley's character. And so he does his best to wish her a Merry Christmas, but also tell him, tell her, 
even though he's married she's married to his you know best friend how much he loves her but while in the original it is set to a Christmas Carol because yeah love actually is also a Christmas movie uh, this sequence turns this you know innocent romantic but actually kind of stocky <laughs> scene into what it could be and what oh, some people might say it actually is and turns the scene into a horror film so watch how you can take uh, simply just switching up the music how you can turn uh, a romantic uh, comedy or romantic scene into something that is horrific. Do do do. All right. And then the final clip that we're watching today is has to do with Chewbacca. And if you are familiar with Owen Wilson, and many of you uh, have probably already watched Loki. Um, I've been watching the work of of Owen Wilson for years since uh, since he got his start in uh, acting and in film with his buddy Wes Anderson. Uh, they both co-wrote Bottle Rocket together and, he, and his first starring role was as Dignan in Bottle Rocket. But one of the things is as you watch Owen Wilson in almost all of his roles, he goes, wow. And so, this is a fun thing where Chewbacca, again, a fictional character that we try to make him believable by creating his roar through a variety of different animals like lions and, and walruses and, you know, that sort of thing. What if every time Chewbacca roared, it was in fact... Owen Wilson's. Wow. So listen and watch uh, this, this, this fun scene of Chewbacca going wow. So this should give you a little bit of an idea of what this semester is going to be like. Uh, we're going to have things that are serious, things that are silly, um, but hopefully it'll give you a sense of all the different things that you can do with sound. So next week, uh, for week two, we are going to be talking about the basics. So going over some of the things that I talked about now, but going into more detail about the basics of the soundtrack and giving you some terms uh, a little bit more in detail. Uh, also, um, I'm gonna be talking about Scott Pilgrim versus the world. And this is where I would love it if you have access to Netflix to please watch the entire film uh, before next week's lecture uh, so that you have a good idea or at least try to watch it during, uh, you know, as we watch next week's lecture. Uh, but the idea is that since I will be referring to things in Scott Pilgrim that I think is uh, important in talking about these basic terms, and I think it really exemplifies some of these things. Now I will have some clips and uh, I'm gonna try to pull some other clips, uh, you know, from it, cause there it's, it, it's very sparse um, on, um, on what is available uh, for Scott Pilgrim right now, which is unfortunate. So, so please, um, if you have Netflix, please watch all of Scott Pilgrim. If you don't have Netflix, try to find someone that does, um, or uh, the library might have a copy of this on DVD. Um, and, uh, and as I said, hopefully everyone is friends, so uh, maybe they can help you out uh, with maybe d watching Scott Pilgrim together. So. So please uh, try to do all that. All right. So first week of class. Enjoy. And uh, next week we'll have uh, more to do. Uh, so you will have some readings uh, that are in the syllabus schedule. And, um, 
and then next week uh, you will want to concern yourself with uh, you know getting done the syllabus uh, quiz in your first weekly discussion journal. Bye!